Mie. It's the place where Japanese people wish to visit at least once in their lifetime. It's known for its beautiful nature, fresh cuisines, and is also home to one of the oldest shrines in Japan, the Grand Issei Jingu Shrine, which was once considered the soul of Japan. Mie is located near the Kansai region, so it's often overshadowed by popular spots like Osaka and Kyoto. But once you pay a visit, you'll realize there's so much to see and do here. While I was in Mie, I had the opportunity to work with the Mie Prefecture Tourism Federation and spent two weeks exploring various parts of Mie, from the mountainside to the coastal regions, going to both the popular and the less known places. So today, I'll be taking you guys on a tour across Mie, heading over to 11 different regions and showing you guys 30 things to do in Mie. Let's get started. We start our journey at the city of Tsu. In the central region lies a small rural town called Haksancho. Haksancho is your typical Japanese countryside town with traditional homes and lots of rice fields. Like, a lot. The closest station is the Sakakibara Onsenguchi Station on the Kintetsu Osaka line, so it's easily accessible from both Osaka and central Mie. For most of my time in Mie, Haksancho was my home base, and I stayed at a place called Guesthouse Ilongo. Here you can stay either as a guesthouse customer or as a farm volunteer, where you can exchange your labor skills for free accommodation and meals. Whether you're traveling on a budget or want to experience a different way of life, I think this is quite a unique way to travel and to experience different cultures. Haksancho also has a couple of sightseeing spots as well. Believe it or not, the first thing I saw when I arrived in town was a giant statue that seemed slightly out of place. Just slightly. During my free time, I decided to go check it out, and it turned out to be a sculpture museum. There was also a temple behind it called the Hojiyama Daikanon Temple that boasts the tallest pure gold Daikanon statue in the world, standing at 33 meters. I visited the temple and it was also full of sculptures, some of deities, others a bit more random. On the western side of town is a local onsen called the Inokura Onsen, and they use onsen water from the nearby Sakakibara Onsen, one of the three famous hot springs in Japan. Since ancient times, visitors of the Issei Jingu Shrine would stop by Sakakibara Onsen to cleanse themselves and purify their spirits before paying a visit to the shrine. They say that these waters can treat skin disease, diabetes, and is even rumored to soothe lovesickness. Regardless of whether you suffer from a broken heart, Sakakibara Onsen waters are used in many onsens nearby, so it's worth visiting an onsen while in Mie. Directly south of Tsu is the city of Matsusaka, and once again, we move away from the urban side and into the mountains to visit the Issei Sanjo Ibutaji Temple. This temple is different from the ones you see in Asakusa or Kyoto because it requires a bit of hiking. And by hiking, I mean using chains and rock climbing because the shrine is in a pretty unique location. This is one of the most unique places I've ever been to and was actually one of my favorite parts of Mie. Although we only had time to hike to the first shrine, there's actually 10 of them spread out across the mountain. It's estimated to take 3-4 to four hours to complete the whole hike and there are parts where you do have to rock climb, use chains, and pass through narrow edges. But as long as you stay careful, I think the hike is doable for most people. To visit the shrine, it costs 500 yen per person and the head monk gives you some explanation and safety tips about the route. You also have to sign a liability form, saying that the temple isn't responsible for anyone's injury or even death. Just like when you go skydiving or any other extreme sports. But don't let that scare you, because once you reach the top, you'll feel a sense of accomplishment. While you're in Matsusaka, I recommend trying the highest quality Wagyu beef in Japan. The Matsusaka Wagyu beef. If your budget allows it. Matsusaka beef is known to be the highest quality of Wagyu, and the most expensive, even more than the world-famous Kobe Wagyu beef. It has a high fat-to-meat ratio and a strict selection process in order for a cow's part to be labeled Matsusaka Wagyu. I'm not a beef expert, but without a doubt, this beef will melt in your mouth. We continue on to the next town, and that is Meiwacho. It's a small town between Matsusaka and Ise, and played a big role in the history of the Ise Jingu Shrine. A quick history lesson. From the 7th century all the way to the 14th, the imperial princesses called the Sayo dedicated their whole lives to the sun goddess of the Issei Shrine and lived in the Saiku Palace. 
Unfortunately, the Psycho Palace couldn't withstand the test of time and was laid in ruins. The town of Meiwacho was built right on top of these ruins, so the town has put an incredible amount of effort into excavating the past and preserving this part of Japanese history. There are replicas of these historic quarters throughout the town, and also the Saiku Historical Museum, dedicated to the Sayo Princess and this period in time. So if you're into learning about the history of Japan, this small town is definitely worth a visit. Besides the history, there are other ways to enjoy your time in Meiwacho. If you love sake, there's a 130-year-old brewery called Asahi Shuzo that offers tours during off-seasons. I got to learn about the sake making process, take a look inside, and even try a sake guessing game with three of their finest products, which I failed miserably. Near the coast is a camping ground where I got to try a tent sauna, a sauna inside a tent. There's a tent made specifically for saunas, and if you put a sauna heater inside, you get a tent sauna. Despite it being summer, I actually enjoyed this a lot. Lastly, I got to spend the night at a trendy accommodation called the Hanare Rokutsuki that has only one room. It's hard to describe, but it's like a cafe-ish kind of vibe. There's a lot of wooden furniture, some antique, some more modern, but the wood theme is consistent. I spent the night alone, but it can fit up to four to five people. And that was it for Meiwacho. Right besides Meiwacho is Taki, and it's home to the largest commercial resort in Japan, Fizon. Fizon is a huge ambitious project to create an entire resort village on the mountainside of Taki. It's the size of 24 Tokyo domes, and there are three main areas, the marketplace, the hotel, and the spa. And we decided to stop by the marketplace for a quick lunch. We move on to Ise, home of the Ise Jingu Shrine, one of the oldest shrines in the country, and was once considered the soul of Japan. Unfortunately, I didn't get to visit the shrine, but I did get to make a quick stop at the Futami Okitama Shrine, another popular spot in Ise. This shrine is famous for the Meotoiwa rocks, two rocks right off the coast connected together by a rope, serving the purpose of a tori gate, and it worships the Japanese goddess of the sun. The name translates to wedded rocks, with the two rocks symbolizing a husband and wife, and the shrine is a popular spot to pray for marriage and relationships. On the eastern side of Ise is Mount Asama, the highest mountain in the area, and near the peak is an ancient temple called the Kongosho Temple, the temple area is spacious and quite aesthetically designed. However, the interesting part was on the other side of the temple. Once you walk past the gate, there's wooden pillars and old graves lined up along a single path. And on the day that we visited, it happened to be foggy, and it felt like we were walking into a different realm. It was a very interesting experience. This place is also great for photos. We continue our journey to the coastal city of Toba. Toba is the resort town of Mie, with many islands off its coast and lots of fresh marine produce. And as with most resort towns, Toba also has lots of hotels, and I got to stay at the Toba Grand Hotel, just a few minutes walk from the main Toba station area. Staying at Toba Grand Hotel was an experience in itself. Once you walk into the lobby, you have a full view of the Ise Bay and an all-you-can-drink drink bar to complement the view. The room was Japanese washitsu style, nice and spacious. There was an onsen on the bottom floor with waters from Sakakibara Onsen, which I mentioned earlier, and last but definitely not least, dinner and morning buffets. My favorite. The next day, we made our way over to the Toba Marine Terminal, and on the way is a Toba Marche. It's a seafood market with a ton of locally caught fish and seafood at quite an affordable cost. Even if you're not planning on buying fish, it's an experience in itself to take a look inside. From the marine terminal, we took a boat and headed over to the big island of Toshijima. A guide from the Kaito Yumin Club took us around the big island and gave us an inside look of life on the island. We got to see the fishing culture that the island revolves around, the local festivals they hold, and ate from the local restaurant with fresh fish that was literally caught 30 minutes before we arrived. After exploring an inhabited island, next was to explore an uninhabited one, and to do that, we hopped on a kayak. The remote island we went to is the middle island of the Mitsushima Islands. Fun fact about this island, on the other side facing the ocean, there's actually a Kanon statue. You can't see it from any part of the mainland, and the only way to see it is either while riding the ferry or by coming to the island yourself. 
with our kayak, we were able to get on the island and take a proper look at the statue. And it just feels awesome to be on a remote island in general. After exploring the sea, it was now time to head over to the mountainside to participate in a traditional practice of waterfall meditation. It was once believed that this waterfall was an embodiment of the Shirataki Daimyojin God. And by meditating here, one will feel a connection with the God and your spirit will be renewed. Today, many people come to participate in the waterfall meditation as a way to escape the busy modern society and refresh themselves. And interestingly, there are way more girls that come to the meditation than guys. Our final stop in Toba is the southeastern corner at a small coastal village called Osatsucho. Many know of the Mikimoto Pearl Island in Toba as the center for ama divers. But what most people don't know is that Osatsucho has the highest population of female divers in Japan. Ama divers are traditional Japanese free divers famous for collecting pearls but also collect various types of seafood and have been around for roughly 2,000 years. Ama divers are mostly women and the kanji, ama, directly translates to sea woman. We took a walking tour around Osatsucho where we got to learn about the ama diving culture and take a brief look into their daily lives. The local shrine of Osatsucho is a popular one and that is the Shinmei Shrine. This shrine worships the Ishigami stone god known as a god who grants at least one wish to a woman. And the ama divers would often pray at this shrine before heading out to sea. Nowadays, that promise attracts many female visitors, ama diver or not. To the south of Toba is the Shima area. Shima is also a coastal region with a good amount of coastline, which means a good amount of beaches. I headed over to the Ko Shirahama beach, which is supposedly one of the best beaches in Japan for surfing, due to its shallow shores and gentle waves. This was my first time surfing and I wasn't very good, but I had fun. Next, I headed up to the northeastern corner of Shima to visit the Anorisaki Lighthouse. The lighthouse is located right on the border of Shima, and you can see the Toba side right across the water. Before arriving at the lighthouse, there's a small cafe and a wide open lawn area. You can go up to the lighthouse and you have this incredible panoramic view, especially on a sunny day. The cafe was also really delicious. Finally, we move on to one of the most iconic spots in Mie, the Yokoyama Observatory Deck. This was another favorite of mine, and it's been on my bucket list for quite a long time. The best way to get here is by car, and from the parking lot is roughly a 10 minute hike, and you'll arrive at a wide open terrace with a full uninterrupted view of the Ago Bay and its 64 islands. The view is absolutely incredible. Next, we head inland to the Odai region, known for its beautiful nature and mountain views. We met up with Raka Raka Activity to try out two of their popular activities, the Bikes Up and the Floating Platform. The Bikes Up is basically a bicycle on top of two floats, and as you pedal, it rotates the propeller in the back, allowing you to move forward. The Floating Platform, on the other hand, uses an electric motor to propel forward, and is perfect for picnics or a casual stroll down the river. With these two, we traveled down the Mia River, and despite the rain, it was actually a really fun and interesting activity. To the south of Odai is the Kihoku area. And here I got to stay at yet another unique accommodation called the Yugakute, a 60-year-old traditional home. From the outside, it doesn't stand out too much in the rural Kihoku area. But once you walk inside, this place has a unique atmosphere. Supposedly, it was built by a famous architect who designed the entire house to resemble Japanese homes from 60 years back and every small detail about the place was carefully thought out from the sliding doors down to each and every intricate design. It's not cheap to stay a night here, but for those that are interested, it would be a unique experience. The next morning, we met up with Kiora Paddle to go kayaking in the Pacific Ocean. The coast of Kihoku is absolutely beautiful, with lots of islands nearby, and the water is so clear that you can even see the fish and corals from above. The weather was also perfect, and we stopped by one of the remote islands for a coffee break and afternoon snacks. Afterwards, we stopped by the local cafe and had some delicious Hawaiian food and shaved ice. South of Kihoku is a small town of Oase, famous for seafood, and we came here exactly for that reason. We stopped by a place called Ototo, a seafood market and also a cafeteria, where you can try traditional Japanese food with a seafood twist. And finally, at the southern tip of Mie 
is the historic town of Kumano, famous for the Kumano Kodo pilgrimage route and known for having an incredible amount of world heritage sites. And one of them is Onigajo, aka the Demon's Castle. Onigajo is a part of the coastline that has unique rock formations, all formed by natural weathering and erosion. This unique coastline stretches out for a whole kilometer and is indeed nature's work of art. Another place with unique rock formation is Tategasaki. Different from Onigajo, Tategasaki has pillar-shaped design, again formed by natural weathering and erosion. The scale of these rocks are quite enormous, with the rock faces reaching a massive 80 meters high. Last but not least, we headed over to the mountainside of Kumano to take a look inside the workshop of a Japanese swordsmith. First, we learn what defines a katana and how to tell its age depending on the patterns on the blade. Afterwards, he explained the katana making process and we also got to take a small tour of the workshop and his equipment. This tour is quite rare and even the people at Mie Tourism Federation weren't sure if we could visit until a few days before. But if it is available, I'll let the information in the description down below. There are a couple of other places in Mie which I didn't get to visit but are worth mentioning. In the Kuana area, there's the Nagashima Spa Land, which is the biggest amusement park in Japan. And there's also the Nabana no Sato, huge flower field that's famous for its incredible illuminations. In the Ise area, there's also the Ninja Museum, a theme park based around the ninja theme. Okage Yokocho, a small district recreated to resemble the Edo period of Japan. And finally, the Spain village of Shima, a Spanish-themed amusement park. And lastly, from the Mie Tourism Federation, I would like to thank Kihira-san for guiding me throughout the whole time, and also Kirihata-san for giving me the opportunity in the first place. Additional information will be in the description. Also, there will be links to the blog posts for Kanko Mie once they go live. Thank you guys for watching, and I hope you add Mie to your bucket list. Take care, and I'll see you guys in the next video.